Yo, 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 what up, though, man? I got Lil G in the building, man. Straight out of Silk, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite R&B groups, man. I don't know if I got conceived to that. You know what I'm saying? But, God damn it, I tried to conceive a lot to it. You know, a lot of practice. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> How have you been, man? Man, I've been great, man. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you this evening. Man, man, I, I you know what? I am very thankful that you took your time to sit down with me. You know what I'm saying? That R&B royalty is definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, definitely in the house today. Silk, man, like, when you think of Silk and what it contributed just to the culture, like, what what do you feel like y'all achieved? Oh, well, I think we set a trend, most definitely, <laughs> when we came into the industry uh, with our style of music. You know, uh, there were boy groups and, you know, bands before us. But when we came in, we kind of took it to another level with songs like Freak Me. Absolutely. You know, and Happy Days and Lose Control. And and so I think we accomplished that. And I think um, we, we have had and still are having a really good run. You know, I think we are blessed to still be in the game as full force as we are right now, you know, considering when we started out in the game, you know? No, absolutely. So longevity is key. So that's why we always try to achieve doing longevity music, you know, that could transcend the times. Which it absolutely is definitely doing that. <laughs> Speaking like when, when we think of so, multi- Platinum, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm saying, selling artists. Do you remember, like, like back then, platinum was that a constant, a consistent thing amongst R and B? Was it that common, or was where were y'all at as far as pioneering, hitting those type of numbers and that type of success? Yeah, you know, there were. Uh, uh, wow, the numbers were going from gold, you know, which at that time was five hundred, you know, to double. Platinum, triple platinum. Uh, Freak Me went triple platinum. The uh, the uh, Lose Control album, the first album, okay, went triple platinum. And uh, the second one was close to platinum. Okay. And then, uh, of course, uh, tonight with uh, <laughs> let me tell you something. <laughs> Meet in my bedroom, and if you, <laughs> no. <laughs> That one, uh, that one was double, man, double platinum, and uh, uh, it, it, it's still being played today. Some nice checks start coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, thank y'all. We love that you love our music. We we gonna keep putting that good music out for you. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so when you when you look over y'all like your discography mm -hmm. and just a collective body of work to you. Out of all of it, like which album or song like is kind of more dear to you personally? Lose control out of the box. Why? Well, not because I had something to do with the writing and the producing of it. <laughs> but uh <laughs> message! No, but uh <laughs> no, the real thing about it was is the way the song came together. Gotcha. Uh, we went in the studio out in um LA. And uh, I was playing piano, and uh, Keith walked in. And so uh, he heard something in a couple of chord progressions that I was playing. And then he said, whoa, 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 what's, what's that? So play that again. And so he started walking around. And that night, we had the love in me. Yeah. <laughs> He gonna kill me. What's up, Keith? <laughs> Love you, Pop. <laughs> no, but uh, and it just started, just started coming together, man. And then I just started coming up, you know, with the progressions for the verse and kind of dwindled into something else. And it was an unorthodox, put together song because it wasn't like your regular intro verse 
chorus, verse, chorus. You know, that's the normal song. It's just like you couldn't really tell. It was just like a story. Gotcha. You know, so it just kind of flowed together like that. And so I remember laying the piano and then we put the instrumentation around it, you know, the percussion and the big old <laughs> and all of that. And so when it got to the point for us to go in and start doing the vocals, everything, it just started flowing. As a matter of fact, we did it in like one take almost. Oh, man. And so Keith was like, I don't know, man. Should, do, should we go back and do that part over again? And Gerald Avert was in there. Alto Wilkie Stewart. Uh, rest in peace. Rest uh, in peace, uh, Uncle Gerald. And uh, Righteous. And everybody looked at Keith and they were like, Man, if you touch anything on that board right now, we going <laughs> to cut your wrist off. Or something like that, man. So, uh, you know, after we did the backgrounds and everything, we started doing the verses and everything just flowed, man. It was it was just a beautiful thing. So that's why that song is really more important to me because it was really full of uh, emotion and just, gotcha. you, you know, total intuitiveness. You know, so you you mentioned Gerald Levert, man, and I'm definitely a Gerald Levert fan. What what was it like just being in his presence and that that type of talent? I know they had to be like how you sitting here as R and B royalty to me. I know those guys had to blow your mind, man. Like, what was it like being around Gerald Levert and what was his personality and work ethic like? <laughs> man, he was so dope. You know, he's he has a commanding, you know, kind of uh, air about him, aura about him, but he's a big old teddy bear. Gotcha. You know what I mean? But when it comes to getting that work, he's he's strategic, you know, just like Keith, you know, because Keith was very instrumental in us doing what we do, but Gerald was right there, you know, with us. And uh, Gerald even, uh, Gerald and Nicholas, they even did uh, a song on our second album. Gotcha. Called Don't Go to Bed Mad. Okay. So we were up in Cleveland recording that with him. So Gerald, man, I looked up to Gerald like everything, man. From Casanova <laughs> you know, with Levert yeah. you know, on up, you know, he just had this thing, you know, a commanding performer, man, and all of that kind of stuff. I remember one of the funniest things that happened with us. We were in a concert and we went on before him. <laughs> he came back in the dressing room. You little short, such and such. You, now you're going to make me go out here and do all this work. <laughs> you just coming out there ripping up the stage and everything like that, man. You must be crazy. <laughs> man, he was out there. He was picking up stools and everything. Oh, man. And he did his little. <laughs> <laughs> he was doing all that across the stage and everything, man. And he said. Came back and he said, now. <laughs> you got it up. You got it up. <laughs> I know um, when, when people talk about like Gerald, like, because he, he he died by suicide, right? Is that, how, how did he pass? Uh, no, nah, I, I think it was, uh, it was um, natural causes. Natural causes. Medi yeah. Because, okay, so I, I guess I had that wrong. But with his story, I know he was kind of, they were saying he was kind of perplexed at times, just not getting the accolades and the awards that he was kind of like striving to get. Like um, he was kind of getting snubbed a lot and not getting those awards that, as a you know a, a, a prolific singer that he was, that were you around during that time just seeing what he was dealing with, with handling things like that. He kind of kept that away from. Got gotcha. you. You know, because um, when I was. In his presence, you know, it was always, you know, uplifting and everything, you know. And so gotcha. he he wasn't the type to really, you know, let us know that if he, if he felt, was having some problems. Gotcha. You know, anything like that. I never saw it. As a matter of fact, when I, I kind of heard some of those things after he had, you know, passed, and I'm like, huh? You know, because I'd been over to the house, you know, up in Cleveland and everything, chilling out with him and everything. Me, him, and Ollie Woodson. Okay. You know, you remember Ollie Woodson? Yes, sir. Temptations? That was my other brother, too, my dad, man. Jesus. <laughs> all of them gone. All our soldiers, boy. 
Gotcha. But anyway, yeah, you know, we'd always have a great time with each other. So okay. Yeah. So so let's go to the beginning, man. So y'all y'all originated out of Atlanta, Georgia, in A, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what year did y'all bring in a group? Around about eighty nine? Is that what, or what? Around what year? Yeah, I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. So I was in Nashville, you know, doing my thing there. I was a like the Chitlin Circuit gig king. Okay. So tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I uh, became a member of a band in a, a club called the Modern Era Club. Okay. And a James Brown, Etta James, and a bunch of people had been through this club. Okay. It's a very historic club. Mr. Sue, you know, was the owner of that with a rest in peace. And, uh, but before that, you know, I uh, grew up in the church. Okay. I started singing when I was like five years old. And uh, I used to sing to Stevie Wonder, Donnie Hathaway, and Michael Jackson records, and all that kind of stuff. And my mama would wake me up when she'd have her parties on the weekend sometimes. <laughs> she'd wake me up out of my sleep, get me up to sing and dance for all the people at the party. <laughs> And then send me right back to bed. And, you know, I'm like, well, what can I have one of them little triangular sandwiches y'all making? <laughs> some, some Kool-Aid. <laughs> you know? But anyway, no. It, and uh, so I started singing with Bobby Jones you okay. know, when I was eight. Oh, wow. So, you know, I was traveling, you know, with him, uh, the James Cleveland Gospel Workshop and all that kind of stuff. And then... Uh, as I went through school, you know, playing for talent shows and things like that, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, I started playing for my church um, at 18. Okay. And uh, so then a little bit after that, I joined the the band. Uh, It was funny, you know, you remember uh, Cadillac Records? Yeah, uh, was what was that? What that's, is that a real record label? Or is it the mo- no, no, I don't. Uh, Cadillac Records. Well, who? Oh, okay, yeah, okay, I got yeah. you, got you. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, you know what they call a headhunter, right? No, it's funny. What's a headhunter? Mm-hmm. Well, a headhunter is when a musician, like say the guitar player, okay, like uh, what is his name? Whoa, smokes that lightning. Howling, uh, Howling Wolf. Okay. You remember when Howling Wolf and uh, 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 Muddy? Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters, yeah. Yeah. So, Howling Wolf's guitar player ended up playing for Muddy. Mm. So, Howling Wolf came into the club that night wreaking havoc. And he told his guitar player, Come off that stage right now. <laughs> so old boy came down. And so he told uh, Muddy, you take any one of my guitar players again, I'll kill you. <laughs> so a headhunter is somebody who comes in and snatches somebody's gig from out from under. Oh, man. Now, I was going with this little young lady at the time, and, and her sister's boyfriend worked at the Modern Era Club. So he was familiar with me, and so he knew, so we was hanging out. So he said, you know what, man, why don't you come down to the spot one night, you know, and, you know, bring your guitar. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm going in, I'm playing Kiss. So they call me up to the stage, the guitar player is up there. I guess he, he sees me walk in with my guitar and so I guess maybe they had something. Maybe he was on the, on the brink of anywhere, some or whatever. Anyway, so he started playing behind his back and everything. He was oh, playing with his mouth and stuff like that, you know. And and Mr. Sue at the club, he was like, "If it ain't funky, I don't want it. Hit. It's got to be funky." All he loved was funk. So so I went on up. I didn't think nothing of it. You know, I ain't, I'm new to this. <laughs> so we, we jamming on the stage and everything. And at the end of the night, Mr. Sue calls, tells Mike to bring me over there to him. In the meantime, I'm looking at the stage. 
And the guitar player is looking pissed. <laughs> and he packing up his stuff, right? <laughs> and so he was like, so Mr. Sue was like, now little buddy, that's what I call funky. <laughs> and so they ended up putting me in the band. Oh man, so that dude got fired. On the, <laughs> on the stage, he knew it was a rap. Oh man. I was like, what had happened? <laughs> and I was like, well, ain't they, are they gonna be mad? <laughs> but anyway, so we ended up ended up being real cool. If y'all go on my social media uh at Gary Lil G, G-A-R-Y-L-I-L-G. You will see a picture that I posted of me and the Sioux City Band. So we was the baddest band in Nashville, man. We won the Budweiser Showdown and everything and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, moving forward to your question now, I kind of got off. No, that's, that's, that was perfect. <laughs> kind of got off kilter. So I signed a production deal in Nashville with Famous Music Publishing. Okay. And I had worked on two songs. I had recorded two songs already. And um, meantime, the group started in 89. They were doing talent shows and sharing showcase and all this kind of stuff and everything and stuff like that. And so they were at a barbecue uh, that their managers had in which the husband of the management team was Keith Sweat's road manager. Mm. Okay, so Keith walks in while they sing to some kids and stuff like that. And he comes and he starts joining in with them and sings with them and stuff. And then he tells Lonnie and Louise that he wants to work with the group. So they ended up doing a song on his album called Give Me What I Want. Okay. But then after that, I guess he kind of felt like, you know, that the lead position wasn't really as strong as he wanted it to be or needed it to be. You know, that brother could, could sing too when I was, you know, I, you know so... When it was about nine of us that ended up auditioning. Okay. So, uh, so Louise had called Desi, who was pre-managing me in Nashville, told her to bring me down. So I went on down, there was about nine of us that, and I ended up getting it. So I sung the two songs that I recorded in Nashville. And so that was in 91. Okay. So January 92 on my birthday, January 26th, message. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Tuesday, <laughs> I um, moved moved to Atlanta, and uh, it was Super Bowl Sunday that day too. Okay, I believe that year, and uh, the rest is history. So here we go. So now you get to Atlanta. How did you end up? How did Silk come into formation? How did the rest rest of the guys come about? At what point? Oh, they they were already there. Oh, so it was already there. Yeah. Yeah. It was a five man group. Got you. I got you. Okay. And so he just replaced one of them with one of the nine. Got you. Now I got you. Okay. Makes sense now. So here I am taking somebody gig again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it wasn't like that. But it was it was me and Al, we real cool. You know, we maintained to be real cool. He understood what everything was. What? What's up? He Okay, so well, th thank you, D. Okay, so so who who is the main artist that you you beat out to get the position in the group? <laughs> well, now they tell me, and I just found this out recently, but they tell me that one of the people that auditioned for that was CeeLo Green. Oh wow! Now I don't know. If that was, I don't know if that's really true or not, but I don't think they tell me that no story. You know what I'm saying? So I said one day I was gonna talk to my boy CeeLo. I'm gonna be like, "Hey CeeLo, did you did you audition for Silk?" <laughs> that would be wild, man. Yeah, I just I think I just gotta hear it from him. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. That's crazy. I, I couldn't even imagine. I can I'm lost for words, bro. And like I can't even imagine. I mean, he definitely got vocals, and it's a different sound. But CeeLo be trying to be sexy in the hell a, in meeting in my bed. <laughs> I don't. Okay, just, <laughs> shout out to CeeLo though. <laughs> wow. 
So, okay, so see what you did. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So okay, so you guys together, <laughs> you beat out C CeeLo Green. Supposedly. From, allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. Uh so now you you and Silk. So at 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 this point, it's the original name original name was always Silk. And how did that name come about? Man, three of the guys, well, two of the guys used to work at McDonald's. Okay. <laughs> John John was on fries. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim, what was Jimmy doing? Anyway, it was Jimmy and John. So, and Timzo is Jimmy's cousin. Okay. The bass man is Jimmy's cousin. Okay. So, he would come in and get the free food all the time. And then their other cousin, Tiger Graham, uh, would come in too. So Jimmy heard John John humming one night while they were there cleaning up and stuff. Okay. And closing up. So he was like, hey, let's let's form a group. Let's do a group. So they okay. So they pulled Timzo in. Timzo didn't want to sing at all for real though. Cause he was like, ah oh, man, that ain't me. You know, I ain't doing all that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so but they finally got him to come on in, Tiger Graham. So it was the four of them. And then they picked up, it was like two or three, I remember Eddie. Eddie was one of them. They, they had quite a, a few couple of changes and stuff. So this particular unit that they ended up with, they were doing talent shows. And um, Gary Glenn, okay, Big G, the other Gary yep. in the group, he... Um, had a, a gospel group with his cousins, three pretty little, pretty little young ladies, you know. Hey, girls. <laughs> and so they were in competition together. And so they heard Big G, so, you know, they started to think, you know, they went after him, you know, hey, man, you know, what you, what you up to, you know, what you think about joining the group, you know, getting in the group. So anyway, so they formed it together, pulled it in, and then, I think Tiger left, somebody else came in, and something else, and then Al. Okay. You know, the one who I ended up, you know, becoming in his stead. So they were together and everything. And so uh so they were doing talent shows and stuff and everything, like I said, it didn't lead to Keith, you know, and all of that. So Okay. So like so now y'all 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 formulate this as a group, you there. Immediately, once you come there, Keith now got y'all automatically in the studio. You're already working. Are they already working with Keith? Like, when once you, you know, get put into the fold, are they already in the studio recording? Where were they, the group at, and at that time, once you got there, professionally? They hadn't been in the, st or had they started with Righteous? Because Righteous had a few songs and stuff, you know, that were already produced. You know, and stuff like that, and that, that Keith had picked. Okay. And I'm trying to remember if I heard vocals on him at all. But anyway, that same night when I got picked, you know, we ended up getting around it, you know, around the the, the box. Gotcha. And they were playing it, and then we just started singing around and everything and stuff. And so, you know, it was kind of gelling pretty good, you know, stuff like that. And then we went upstairs after the night was over, you know, we sitting around the couch, you know, in the den, you know, had a long talk with each other. You know, they were picking my head about some things, you know, because I'm the oldest. Okay. And uh, so it, it, it was just really cool. You know, it was just a really cool vibe. And then immediately we started going into the studio. So now y'all get into the studio. Mm -hmm. At who, what hit or which single comes up first while y'all in the studio and y'all start working? Happy Days ended up being the first single. Okay. So tell me a little bit about Happy Days. How did it how did that song come to fruition? Like as far as the production side of it, when y'all got that song? Okay. Alton Wilkie Stewart. Okay. Was the producer on that one and Keith. Keith was the writer on that one. Okay. And um, we went out to LA. Um I think Wilkie uh presented his song to Keith and he liked it. You know, it used the uh, James Brown sample, Big Payback. Gotcha. And um, 
all of that. It was, it was a dope song. So we're out in LA. And that was no Southern Tracks in Atlanta was the first session that I went to. And I think we were working on It Had to Be You. Okay. From the first album. Okay. And uh it was It Had to Be You and maybe a little bit of Girl You For Me. Okay. And then we went out to LA and that's when we did Happy Days and then that's when Lose Control came about. Man, so t- so tell me that creative, like when y'all heard it, did immediately y'all know like that was the one like, or in, in your mindset, like with Lose Control or with Happy Days, like immediately were these in our heads like this is it, this is the one ar- already? Yeah, you know, we pretty much, we were under Keith's reign, so. I got you. Know, you know, and I'm new to the game, so, you know, I ain't trying to upset no, <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, no way. So I'm just like, well, whatever we, what we doing? Okay, let's go. Let's get it. You know, and so we were depending upon him, gotcha. you know, as the label, you know, it was Kia Records under Electra. Gotcha. And uh, so we just let him take the reign, and so he was choosing you know, the singles and stuff. I mean, he had the expertise. I mean, he had like plaques on the walls and stuff, you know. This is Keith Sweat. So, Absolutely. You know, we don't let him have it. <laughs> he came in the studio one day. The last song that we recorded was Freak Me. Mm. That was the last song we recorded. So you got five church boys. <laughs> You got five church boys. So we had done Happy Days, It Had to Be You, Girl, You For Me, Baby, It's You, <laughs> all those songs, and uh, the Delphonics, Girl, why don't you just give our love a chance? Did that one, and all it, everything was just, you know, no freaky songs, no way in sight, right? <laughs> The only thing that was kind of like freaky was when in Happy Days, when you see, lick you up and down and around and around. But that goes back quick. Right. You know what I'm saying? So Keith comes in the studio, yo, babe, yo, listen to this. And yeah, you know, I need y'all to go in here and do this all about right here. You know, we started listening. Let me lick you up and down. Hold up, Keith. <laughs> yeah. We can't do that. <laughs> Our mama's not that mama's is gonna kill her. We checked and yeah, yo, baby, I just need you to trust me, man. You know, I know what I'm doing, man. Yeah, I'm telling you, man, this don't gonna be it, baby. This, you know, you just you gonna do it. So he finally talked this. <laughs> he finally talked us into it, man. So so I was like this, you know, you know, like when they were on five hard beats, when they was fighting and they was putting up his yeah. clothes. And so, you know, when they put it together strategically and when uh, 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 Eddie Kane said, yo, you're right, Doug. If we're going to do it, we don't, if we ain't going to do it right, we don't need to do it at all. <laughs> so I got my mind together. Happy Days did its thing. Who knew that freak me? Let me lick you up and down Till you say stop. <laughs> Let me play with your body, baby. Make you real hot. Let me do all the things you want me to do. Cause tonight, baby, I'm gonna get freaky with you. How old are y'all when when the song is given to y'all? How old are y'all when y'all record this record? <laughs> what was John John? 18? Oh. <laughs> John John is the baby. I gotcha. think John John was 18, 19. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Wow. Come on, man. So 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 now y'all record this song. Like, while you recording the vocals, are you sitting here like, man, is, is it coming together well? Like, are you saying, like, you know what, I'm actually liking it like now that y'all getting into it, or are you still like, hell no, my mama ain't about to. Well, like I said, if you're gonna do it, you gotta gotta do, do it right. Got you. Go all in. So I just put my 
I put everything to the side and said, it's got to be right. So I just went on in. I went on in deep inside myself. I mean, because I, I always been a little freaking little boy anyway. So. <laughs> no. Jesus wept and I see why. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so I just had to go into my inner being a little bit, you know. So now after we had recorded, after it came out and everything, I thought we were going to get slapped upside the head. But fortunately, it didn't happen that way. Everybody was so proud of us and everything, you know, for, and they were just really giving us accolades and just pushing us, man. And what the pastor way. say? At, at your home church. <laughs> he didn't say much. <laughs> but what he did say to me, arrested soul. <laughs> what he did say to me, I understood. You know, I mean, he was he was a cool cat. Gotcha. He was a cool old cat. So, you know, he knows you have to spread your wings and stuff. You know, and they made the announcement and everything when I was leaving, you know, the church to go and join the group and to be on my way to Atlanta and everything. And everybody just, you know, they applauded because, you know, it wasn't a whole lot of For real. coming out of Nashville because Nashville was pretty much known for country gotcha. music. Yeah. You know, and then gospel was next. So. Everybody cheered me on and everything. So it it was really a comforting situation and I felt a whole lot better afterwards. And so yeah. <laughs> So like <laughs> I know I know everyone talk about like that success, especially in the early days when you hear like how a lot of artists will have all these accolades and make all these sales, but they really weren't getting paid. Well, how did you have that? Did you ever have that bad label deal? And it just didn't <laughs> that wouldn't get paid. Like, uh, my career's been great. <laughs> 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 I don't have too many uh, negative things to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you, as you know, in this game, it's up and down. Right. You know, you've seen the stories. You know, just about every 90s group back in the day had a little something, something. <laughs> you know, as far as the money is concerned, you know, but, you know, you have to learn how to take every negative, turn it into a positive. Gotcha. <laughs> you know, and you have to learn how to work the system. And if you're going to be a part of the system, you got to learn it. And so I'm going to tell all you youngsters out there, who are aspiring to be in this game. And those of you who are already in the game, watch your backs. Make sure you got somebody in your camp and on your camp that gives 199.99% about you and you only. Hmm. So freaking, I mean, well, I, I keep wanting to say, so like, so now the record is done, the record is out. At this time, is this at that time was that your highest charting single? At that time, yeah. that y'all released, "Freak Me." Yeah, "Freak Me." Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the the highest one. As a matter of fact, it overtook uh, Whitney Houston, Wow, Janet Jackson, and uh, it, it it stayed number one for. Whew, Man, I shocked the world for a minute. Yeah. So now. I assume y'all y'all go out on tour. This record going crazy. Like, who did y'all partner with up when y'all went on tour? Did y'all tour with anybody? Oh yeah, uh, we did. Uh, we were with Al Heyman. Okay, you know that name. Yep. Um, our first tour was the Coca Cola. Was it the Coca Cola Super Fest? Yeah, and so on our tours, it was us, Shy. Okay. H Town, SWV, and uh, what's the other girl group? Don't walk away, boy. Yeah. I'll be Let's... right there for you. Jade. Don't... Jade. Yes, Jade. Hey, Jade. <laughs> Love y'all. Hey, 
a little older. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, um, so then we doing the loan over into the Budweiser. Budweiser Superfest. That was okay. Al Steele, you know, and uh, we toured with all of them. We, we toured with LL Cool J, BBD. Uh, we even did a couple of things with New Edition, Men Condition. Okay. You know, it was it was just circulating around, man. So we had a long stint. I mean, that when we first went out on tour, we were on tour for like a year and a half. Oh man. Straight over in the states, overseas. Oh, Japan. T- tell me about Japan. That's what I was about to ask. Like, oh. out of all the places you toured, what was the most memorable? And far as good, and what was the worst place you ever performed at? Oh, Wild on tour. Konnichiwa. <laughs> He said, C, is that ain't that Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Japanese, but I know that. <laughs> oh, I should have said, <laughs> Yeah, my fault. <laughs> That's a fuck, what was it about Japan that you that that you loved about it? Oh, how are you? Welcome. Come on in. Oh boy. It's 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 a great experience, you know. They really honor you mm. and and respect you more than actually the states actually do. Oh wow! Everywhere overseas, they love us. <laughs> you know, y'all love us too, of course. But they just show it a little bit more than you know <laughs> than you guys do. But the one thing that really stood out to me over in Japan is that. They sung every lyric back to us while we were on stage. Oh wow! God, you find me <laughs> and got me for you. <laughs> it was a beautiful thing, man, to look out in the crowd, man, and you in a whole nother country, man. And you don't think, well, we all know that they study the English language from year round, right? Anyway, in school and everything. And they go to school year round. So, but that that was just amazing, you know, to me. That's the first time experiencing something like that. You know, each city and all the girls and, you know, people in the audience that's singing your songs back to you. Have we arrived? <laughs> <laughs> Did y'all deal with the, the whole thing of women trying to sneak in the hotel or being in a room or... All of that, that is, is those stories like common. Who, me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm safe, sanctify the field with the Holy Ghost. I know I ain't happened to you. Uh, go down, Moses. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, hmm. And his couple of occasions, I don't know. I don't know how they do it. But they will end up on your floor. I remember it was one time we went to we went to London. And we were on our way to the hotel. We came in London Heathrow, right? It was London Heathrow. So <laughs> We get to the hotel. We were like, did the promoter tell these girls where we were staying? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they must have some kind of system where they investigate stuff and everything because the lobby was full of girls. Oh, damn. And we walk in the hotel. <sighs> Who does this? <laughs> Who lets them in here like this? So man, it is it, it, we've had some experiences. I will tell you, yes, it happens for all of us uh, oh, in the music industry. Well, with, with Key Sweat, people always talk about the running joke with Key Sweat. Is he you be begging like Key Sweat? That Key Sweat be begging in his songs, begging and pleading. How did he? Did you ever bring that or talk to him about that? How does he feel about just that that running joke? Or begging like he sweat and song. 
Yeah, he don't, he don't pay no attention. Let him tell it. He created five little Keith Sweats. Mm. <laughs> 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 that, that, that's what he'll tell you. Yo, baby, I created five little Keith Sweats. <laughs> what, what, what's his personality like? His demeanor like? He, he, is he sw- is he real suave? Is that his thing or what? What Keith like? Yeah, you know he he real cool. You know he. About his business, you know, he's a stickler, you know, for things and stuff like that, you know, which is good. Okay. Because, you, know, you know, you need, you need uh, structure. Gotcha. You know, and things like that, you know, and his experience in the industry, you know, I learned a lot from him. You know, he, he taught us how to sing a song, you know, gotcha. instead of, you know, doing a lot of runs and everything and stuff like that. You know, you position them. I learned how to position my runs, you know, in certain places and things like that. And then you do a song, it's like a rap. Mm. You know, you should start off here. And then, cause you gotta have somewhere to go to in the end. Gotcha. Yeah, so. Like production wise and producers, like, I know a lot of people look at like R. Kelly as one of the greatest uh, R&B, you know, singer, songwriters, producers. Like, have y'all ever worked with R. Kelly? Oh, hey, you ever met R. Kelly? And what was that relationship like? Oh, yeah, I've been in his presence a bunch of times. Yeah, he's he was he was a cool cat, you know. He give you accolades, you know. Yeah. You need him. He give you respect. You know, you, you had to give it back to him, though. <laughs> you know? And, of course, he's standing way up here. And I'm like that, say, hey, how you doing, man? <laughs> Love your music, dog. Hey man, you the king, man. Hey man, we need to get in there and do something sometime. Yeah, man, let's do it. You know, whatever, you know. He loved basketball. Mm. Of course, you know that, all that stuff, you know. So, great experiences when I was, you know, in his presence and with him. We didn't get a chance to actually work with him. Gotcha. But it was talked about. Yeah, but we never did get that chance. So then meeting in my bedroom, how long after, Freak you did it. Um, this freak, I keep saying the name and song. Wrong. Freak me, freak me. I keep saying freak you, freak me. Mm-hmm. The uh, meeting in my bedroom come up. Well, we had three singles off of that first album. Okay, and then Lose Control, you know, did its thing right. on its own. You know, we never did a video for that one. Why not? And it was never released as a single. I don't know why. Mm. Is it too late? Could y'all go back and do one now? Aha. <laughs> Aha. <laughs> All you gotta do is eat the soup. Okay, where's the spoon? <laughs> there you go. So, and uh, so yeah, we've been talking about a bunch of stuff that we could redo and some things that we could do. But uh, of course, you know, we had a second album, the self-titled album. Yep. We're hooked on you, Don't Rush. And all of those were on that one. Okay. And uh, those were the two singles from that one. Was it another one? Hooked on You, Don't Rush. No. Mm-mm. No. Then after that album, now on that second album, that's when we went from Kia Records. Okay. Sylvia Roan ended up coming over to Elektra to take over as CEO. And so, we ended up signing straight to Electra on that second album. Okay. And so then after that one, that's when the third album took place uh, tonight. Okay. And that's when me and my bear, me and bear, okay. Mm-hmm. So on that one, who, who wrote and produced on that song? Because that song went crazy too. Me and my bedroom, that was written by, well, Daryl Delight Allenby was the main producer okay. for that album. Uh, per Sylvia Wrong. Okay. So that was our first encounter with him. So we clicked so hard. <laughs> you know, it was crazy when we put that album together, you know. And uh, that was Daryl Delight Allenby, uh, Lincoln Browder, Antoinette Roberson. Mm. Yeah, so that was a triple threat right there. Gotcha. Yeah, so they, they did that one. And they, we did the whole album with them, pretty much. 
And then uh, there were a couple of other producer teams that we did a few songs with on that album as well. And then I produced and, and uh, John John and I uh, and Big G wrote on some of the songs and everything. So I was a part of like seven songs on that album. So, so if you were to rank groups who are responsible for making the most kids, the most babies out here. Which who's your top five? Where your top five baby making groups of your era? Silk. Okay, <laughs> this is, that's fair. Uh, Jodeci. Hmm. H Town. Okay. Um, next. Okay. Would you say next or Drew Hill? I'm almost, I'm, 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 I would say Drew Hill. I, I was more my, me, for sure. Yeah, Drew Hill. Definitely. And 112? 112, well, yeah. 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 Okay, I, I give you that. But then Drew Hill is later than 112 then. Wasn't nobody getting it into Boys and Men. That was straight. They was going to the end of the road. Oh, <laughs> 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 and my boys. What's up, y'all? But hey, can't nobody not. They grind. Those boys right there, they took over the pop charts like crazy that is the major pop group of that era man i'm telling you yeah they was boys and men was our played at my middle school dances so i got I knew mad they respect say. for them boys <laughs> right there boy <laughs> Woo! oh yeah profile public announcement yeah you had it was quite There's a few of them so like with the state of r&b now like today you know, like the mm -hmm. 90s, that was definitely that golden era, early 2000s, that golden era. But you saw like where at one point R&B dominated the charts and hip hop was kind of a just a little thing that was cool. It was just a little section. But then you start to see hip hop start to rise and it almost looked like R&B took a decline. Like, did you ever see hip hop being as big as it is today? And what do you feel like the stance on R&B music as of today? Well, in auto tune. I've been the kind of person who always believed that there's room for everybody in this industry. Gotcha. So it was shocking as fast as it came about, you know, and then the decline of R and B, you know, was kind of shocking to me in a sense, because really hip hop was actually an extension of R and B. Right, yeah. You know, because sampling and everything, you know, they sampled all the R&B stuff, you know, to get their stuff. So, you know, I think they intermingle, you know, in a sense, you know, period, you know. But, you know, in R&B and, well, in, you know, it's trendy at times. You know what I mean? And everybody goes with the trend. You know, so that was something that was new to everybody's ear. You know, and it was the beats. Yeah. You know, the boom, 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 you know, all of that, you know. So it was intriguing. And so it came about. And, you know, in the beginning, true hip hop was talking about some real stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it kind of got watered down, you know, as the, the foreplay from R and B started dwindling down to like the one play as it is now. Gotcha. Women don't want that. What mm. woman do you know that wants you? To kick? I'm out. Holla at you. <laughs> <laughs> Be gone. You know, and then you know the respect for the woman, you know, was lost because you know we got to give credit where credit is due. R and B music 
has always been about the woman. You know, emotions, you know, swooning them and schmoozing them and trying to, you know, get the girl, you know, and everything and stuff like that. Chivalry, you know, had to come into play. So that's why we took off like we did because we got the ear of the woman and we got the mind of the woman instead of just the physical. Of the gotcha. Woman. Because we didn't come out straight out with our lyrics talking about what we were going to do. We found a strategic way to ride that way. Mm. You know, and so, and then when hip hop came about, you got the hard culture, you know, basically from New York, you know, it was telling life stories, you know, how it was in the streets, you know, and everything. You just, just raw, you know, and it seemed like, you know, that's the main word for a lot of great music, raw. Mm. You know, it was just raw, and then it just whew, catapulting it in R and B. You know, because for the '90s, I say the night for R and B, the '90s era was like the last era. Yeah. You know, not the last, but the most because powerful think, for R and B. Because you so, think like two thousands. When it comes as far as like introducing new R and B groups, I mean, really, the only ones you had was Destiny Child. That was kind of newer introduced, newer male groups. A day twenty six from Diddy was yeah. probably you, you didn't have it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, my college years, it was like male groups was out of there. The only R and B singers I'd probably say I had at that time, I mean, Usher. Kind of kept it alive mm-hmm. with you know that that one album that Confessions I think that's the name of the album mm-hmm. that album Chris Brown came but then it was more real hip I mean he was singing Chris Brown be blowing but yeah it was very hip hop more fused like it didn't really have that two R and B sound right and 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 you know I might have to say that we might be guilty of starting it <laughs> so <laughs> Freak Me was a rap song. Pretty much, baby, don't you understand? The verses mm-hmm. was wrapped. Yep. You know, uh, happy days, another jam. Happy days when it's moved out. Looking and making and taking the time to see what your women are all about. A sickle, get it, slap it and grab it. Make it last forever, cause I bet you gotta have it. We R and B and rap. So Got we, you. We infused it, so we might have started it right. <laughs> 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 Be, be, before I let you out of here, versus, if y'all could do a versus, would y'all and who would you think be a good versus for y'all? Jodeci. That'd be hard. <laughs> That'd be hard. Okay. So if y'all go with normally versus, it's what, 20 songs? So what would be the score? Hit for hit. <sighs> oh, yeah. Bruh, <laughs> that's hard. I don't know. I don't know, bruh. What must I say? What must I do? <laughs> hey, them boys. So, freak me versus freaking you on versus who wins? Huh? So. Freak, freak me versus freaking, freaking you. Who, who, which one takes that one? Well, because of the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> because of the numbers and the looking at the charts, I, I, I'd have to say, I can't, I'm not biased, y'all, but I had to say freak me. There you go, for sure. Yeah. But I tell you what, man, what what do y'all got planned on coming on like right now as far as what so I know you said y'all working on anything, man. Can I get an exclusive? Like what what we got in the tank right now that's about to hit the scene? <laughs> well, we're still doing a few shows here and there. And uh, we're getting ready to go back in the lab. And uh meantime, while we're waiting on that, I've been in the lab okay. working on my solo project. Still with the group, 
I ain't going nowhere. Meet him in the silk, make something happen. Rapping those above Bamity, silk and move. Gotta lose his attitudes. Bamity, stop, stop, think, listen. Bamity, fly, fly, blessed indeed. Can I get some? <laughs> Six and a half. But anyway, yeah, I have a new project that's coming out. Uh, my first single will be coming out the end of February. Okay. And it's called That's My Baby. But the name of my album is G7. Okay. No parole. Okay. Display. G7 is the plane. Right, that's a plan. No, what is G seven? No parole. So explain the title. G is the seventh letter of the alphabet. Okay. I'm the seventh child. Okay. Seven is the number of completion. And the no parole part. I'm sentenced to life in music. I ain't getting out. Ah, gotcha. That's <laughs> we are, we are in on that. That's dope, man. <laughs> well, Lil G. RB Royalty, Silk in the building, man. I appreciate you for sitting down with me. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you having me, man. It's It's been great, man, here with you, man. Uh, I, I I really appreciate this. This is really cool. Man, let me be, you know, a, a big man model in one of the videos, man. Let me be do something. Let me have a cameo or something. Come on in. Can you skate? I mean, I learn. <laughs> 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 put a green screen on. Make me look like I'm south. Just move my arm. It's okay. I'll put you up with my man Tiny. I let I let y'all be on the sides of me. Yeah, there we go. I, I'm cool with that. I had to break in. <laughs> you know, we on the next one we'll tap in because I didn't get into the acting part. But I know y'all got mean and go. But man, we definitely I'm, I'm gonna find you when I come to the A. Let's do it, man. All right, man. Well, I'll see you soon. Y'all get ready for part duh. <laughs> This is part one. Get ready for part the. As as they say in Japanese, C. Arigato. Arigato. Please.